Hello, and welcome to QuantPy. In this video, we are going to introduce stochastic calculus and the underlying stochastic processes. This is intended to provide an overview of the subject, so if you don't quite follow some of the mathematical formulae, that's nothing to worry about, as we are going to build all the concepts you see here in the subsequent presentations. We only expect you to get an understanding of the bigger picture so that when we discuss the individual topics, you would have an understanding of how these fit into the wider scheme of stochastic calculus. To introduce the subject, let's recall a few facts from ordinary calculus. Calculating the definite integral of a function over a given interval usually gives a number. Don't worry about the individual calculation steps. And solving a differential equation with given initial conditions, results in a deterministic function. Here, x is a function of time. No wonder, before the stochastic processes were integrated into physics and mathematics, some people were convinced that, if they could get the equations describing the dynamics of the whole system and the initial conditions, then they would be able to predict anything. Well, did not turn out quite like that. And stochastic processes are to blame. In stochastic calculus, Instead of the constant and the deterministic functions, one usually gets a stochastic process as a solution. You may interpret t as time, and it could be discrete or continuous. And it is time we introduced the stochastic process. Recall that a random variable is a function that maps the outcome of a random experiment to a numerical value, typically the real line. For example, flipping a coin results in a head or a tail. Knowing which side it lands on is important, but to make it useful for calculation, one needs to map it into some meaningful numerical value. For example, there are several coin flipping games. One simple game involves exchanging one quid, depending on which side the penny lands on. Head, you receive one quid, tail, you pay one quid. This is an example of a random variable. Stochastic process is a generalization of the random variable. It is a family or a collection of random variables. Let's continue with the coin example. Now, let's assume that we toss the coin every second 15 times with the same stake on each toss. Now, to visualize the process, let's plot your net position over time. X axis represents time in seconds, whilst Y axis represents your net position. First toss, which happens one second from now, is head, so you get one quid. Your position remains at one, until the next toss, which happens one second later. Another win, and your gain jumps to two, and remains so, until the next toss. You cannot be winning forever, so you lose the next toss, and your position declines by one. And the game continues. This is an example of a stochastic process. Now, you can imagine many people playing this same game, or you playing the game, again and again, and then aligning, the start time of, all these games. Every time, the sequence of head and tails would be different, and you will get an ensemble of such paths. For example, three different paths might look like this. One thing before we go, notice the paths are continuous from the right, and have limits from the left. They are the so-called, R, C, L, L, right continuous with left limits. French name for this is, Cadlag. This looks simple, but is an important concept in the study of stochastic processes. This is more like, a jump process. A continuous process will have similar characteristic, but will look smoother. One can view this, as a collection, or an ensemble, of functions of time. Now, the value of the process, at a given time, is a random variable and one can apply all sorts of statistical concepts to it, such as mean, variance, and probability distribution. Or one can calculate the autocorrelation and covariance between the values of the process at two different times. Or one can view each realized path as a function of time, and calculate statistics of a single, realized, path over time. These are called ergodic statistics as compared to ensemble statistics we saw earlier. Now that we understand how a stochastic process looks like, let's analyze its dimensions in a bit more detail. Let's denote the cumulative probability distribution function of the process at time t 
by f this essentially gives the probability that the value of the process at time t is below some given value x now let's introduce an increasing sequence of time index essentially we are splitting the interval over which the process is analyzed into sub intervals we can write the cumulative probability function at an arbitrary time index say i as follows we can write the joint distribution of the process at two given times as follows we can extend this to joint distribution at multiple points easily and if we let the number of points increase then we get the joint distribution for the whole interval hence a stochastic process can be quite general now you can imagine that specifying the whole joint distribution could be quite complicated and at the same time allows for a lot of variety imposing some structure on the process makes it easier to specify the process next we discuss the most common or shall we say well known simplifications a process is called markov if the probability distribution of the future value depends on the current value and not the past values it is memoryless process in the sense that it does not remember its past if we write it in terms of conditional probability then it says that the conditional probability of the process at time index k plus 1 depends only on the value of the process at time index k and is not affected by its history it is easy to see that with the markov structure one can specify a process with just the current distribution and the one period conditional probability distribution one can then iteratively generate the probability distribution at any point of course one can make the markov process more complicated if one wishes and don't forget the normal or gaussian distribution what would probability be without the normal distribution a process is called gaussian if each finite dimensional vector has a multivariate normal distribution as you know normal distribution is completely determined by its mean and covariance so one just needs to specify the first two moments to specify the whole process though the moments here would be a vector and our matrix notice we said that the finite collection has a normal distribution and we then implied that the stochastic process which is a whole probability space of functions is gaussian isn't it remarkable that the whole process can be defined this way in fact there is more to it there is a nice theorem called kolmogorov's extension theorem which says that for any finite dimensional distribution that satisfy two simple consistency conditions there exists a probability space and a stochastic process which has the same finite dimensional distribution another popular simplifying assumption involves some form of stationarity a process is called stationary or strictly stationary to be precise if it is invariant under time shifts essentially shifting time does not affect any of its statistical characteristics of any order so this equation holds for any set of times any amount of time shift and for joint distributions of any order one can then deduce that all statistics of the process if they are defined will be the same at any time for example the mean will not be affected by the time shift so it must be constant same goes for the variance and for the autocorrelation if it is defined though it would be a function of the length of time interval between the two time instances strict stationarity could be hard to establish or validate so a lower order stationarity could be more useful for some practical applications a process is called k order stationary if the above holds for orders up to k only the most interesting case is the second order stationary process often called weak sense or wide sense stationary process this is more commonly defined in terms of the first two moments specifically that the mean variance and covariance are not function of time though the covariance can depend on the time difference or length of interval between the two time indices and as we know that a gaussian distribution is fully specified by the first two moments so if one assumes that the stochastic process is gaussian as well then the weak stationarity becomes equivalent to the strong stationarity and probably the most well known simplifying assumption is that of independence if one assumes that the process values at different times are independent then one can write the joint probability as the product of the individual probabilities and one can specify the whole process 
by specifying the probability distribution, at just one point. Let's quickly summarize, the key features of the four processes, we discussed so far. A process is called Markov, if the future values depend on the current value, and not the past values. A process is called Gaussian, if every finite collection of its values, at different times, has a multivariate normal distribution. A process is called stationary, if its characteristics are invariant, under time shifts. A process is called independent, if its values, at different times, are independent. Now, a process describing a physical system, or a price, cannot be, a fully random process, as there must be some link, between the values of the process, over time. Imagine a stock price, taking random values, from 0 to 100, with no link between the successive values, that it's not going to go down, very well. So the last two properties, that is, stationarity and independence, are usually applied to the increments of the process, instead of the values of the process. We now consider two such processes. Pass on process, which is a counting or jump process, and Brown in motion or Wiener process, which is a diffusion process. Both processes are Markov. We will start with the Poisson process. A process is called Poisson, with parameter lambda, if it satisfies the following three properties. The process starts at zero. Or since we are talking about probabilities, we should really be saying that the probability of the process starting at zero, is one. The increments are, independent. That means, if we divide the interval into, disjoint intervals, the changes in the process values, over these disjoint intervals are, independent. And the change in the process, over an interval from, s, to, t, follows, Poisson distribution, with parameter, lambda times the length of the interval. The above implies that the increments are, stationary, as the parameters do not depend on time. It is very easy to depict the process, visually. The visual is similar to the random walk example, that we showed at the beginning, x-axis represents time, and y-axis, represents the value of the process. But now, assume that you have a biased coin which has a small probability of head. Assume this probability equals the lambda in our definition of Poisson process. And assume you have a friend who can toss the coin at an extremely fast rate. So, what is the game now? Well, every time head turns up, you give him one quid. There are no penalties, so he can only win. Which is fair, because he is doing all the work. Now, the amount of time it would take for a head to turn up is a random variable, and hence will vary. In discrete time, the number of trials needed to generate a head, follows, geometric distribution, the continuous time equivalent of which is, exponential distribution. So, the length of the intervals between successive successes, will follow an exponential distribution. Again, notice the paths are right continuous, and have limits. Recall that, we classify them as, right continuous with left limits. Let's move to the Brown in motion, or Wiener process, which is now, easy to define. A Brown in motion, or Wiener process, satisfies the following three properties. The process starts at zero. Or the probability of the process starting at zero, is one. The increments are, independent, and stationary. That means, if we divide the interval into, Disjoint intervals, the changes in the process values, over these disjoint intervals are, independent. And the change in the process, over an interval from, s, to, t, follows, normal distribution, with mean zero, and variance equal to, the length of the interval. Visualizing the brown in motion paths, should now be trivial task. Everything is very similar to what we have seen before, except that the paths are now continuous and the increments are now taken from a normal distribution, with mean zero, and variance equal to the length of the interval. As you can see, there are several, similarities between the Poisson, and Brown in motion processes. Both start at zero, both have independent, and stationary increments, and both satisfy the, right continuous with left limits, property. A process satisfying these properties, is called, a Levy process. This defines, a much larger, class of processes. This class of processes has a close connection with the class of the so-called infinitely divisible distributions. The name sounds complicated, but it is easier to understand than the central limit theorem. A random variable, 
say x, is infinitely divisible if for every positive integer there exists a sequence of independently and identically distributed random variables which we represent by y, such that x is equal in distribution to the sum of these variables. Interpreting the y's as the increments of our Levy process over disjoint intervals should reveal the connection between the two. This class contains a number of well-known distributions, as one would expect. Now, we know enough about the underlying stochastic processes, so let's move to the calculus part. As you may recall, calculus is all about taking limits. All common calculus concepts, such as continuity, derivative, and integral, are explained and proved using limits. The limits are then soon forgotten, and everything gets reduced to rules. Rules of differentiation, rules of integration, and so on. But at the heart of all these operations are, limits. Limits play a prominent role in stochastic calculus, as well. One can start with, the same idea of limit. But it is helpful to write this, in terms of a sequence. Sequence is not any different from a function, but its domain is the positive integer so it has a more convenient representation. We know that limits of sequences of functions or series play a very important role in probability theory. For example, we define the value of the random walk as the partial sum of the outcome associated with each toss. So we can see this is a sequence and we can explore its behavior as n becomes large using limits. Another common example is the partition of an interval. One divides an interval into n subintervals, and one then performs some summary calculation over these intervals. Increasing n in a suitable manner then amounts to the refinement of the partition. And one can then explore the limiting behavior of the summary statistic as the partition becomes dense. Now applying the above concepts to our stochastic process is not going to be easy. We saw that the stochastic process is like a whole space of functions. So we will need to check the convergence or limiting behavior for each path. But this is not really necessary. If we can demonstrate that the sequence converges in the probabilistic sense, then that should suffice. For example, if we can demonstrate that a certain property holds on the set of paths which has probability 1, then that is quite convincing proof of convergence. This is called almost sure or almost everywhere convergence. For example, we can use this notion to demonstrate that the paths of Brownian motion are not differentiable. In ordinary calculus, one would have to show that the limit does not exist or is infinity. In stochastic calculus, to show that the paths are not differentiable almost everywhere, it would suffice to prove the following statement. There are other notions of convergence as well, and different forms may be easier to prove in different situations. For example, convergence in the rth mean is defined as follows. It says that the expected value of the rth power of the difference between the two approaches zero. When r equals 2, this is called mean square convergence. This convergence is used in the proof of the stochastic integral. There are two weaker notions of convergence that are also widely used. Convergence and probability which means that the probability of large differences between the two is zero. And convergence and distribution, which means the distribution of the sequence approaches, the distribution of the limiting process, as n becomes large. We can now move on to the details. We are going to develop the theory using Brownian motion process as the main stochastic process. Most of the results will carry over to a large class of stochastic processes, however, to keep the presentation simple, we are not going to make general statements. In the next few videos, we are going to explore the properties of the Brownian motion in more detail. We are then going to use these to develop the concept of stochastic integration and through which the symbolic concept of stochastic differential. We are then going to apply the theory to few stochastic differential processes that are widely used in many subjects. We will then discuss some concepts that are specific to stochastic calculus such as change of probability measure and the elegant theory of martingale we hope you will have a comprehensive understanding of stochastic calculus by the end of the playlists and we look forward to seeing you in the next video